My name is Amal Ali. I'm a policy officer. Um, so I currently work on uh, criminal justice issues that's right across the criminal justice pathway. But I'm particularly interested in uh, policing and police powers, particularly around uh, the policing of drugs. So in the past, I worked for Release, that's the Centre of Expertise in Drugs and Drug Law, and I managed their youth-led stop and search project, uh, which is Why Stop. So I worked with young people. Uh, so it's essentially, uh, it was a program or is a program that's there to equip young people with really practical tips and tools so that they know how to handle police interactions in a safe and confident manner. So what we would refer to as a harm reduction approach. Uh, so we done this through uh, delivering workshops, uh, teaching young people about their rights. And I think, for me, it provided a really valuable insight into how young people see policing and their perceptions of sort of what they think police priorities are, um, as well as their own lived experiences. So an exercise that I would do during our workshops is I would ask the young people to list all the objects that police could search them for. So things that are like contraband. And um, we'd go around the room, you know, drugs, an obvious one, weapons, another obvious one, stolen items, goods, whatever. And then I'd ask them what they thought uh, policing priorities were in terms of stop and searches. So of those objects that they listed, what they thought um, police would be looking for the majority of the time or were more likely to search them for. And um, I think in the beginning, it did surprise me that a lot of the young people were saying that, oh, that's obvious. Police are like using stop and search uh, to recover weapons and knives. And for me, it was like I said, it was it was surprising at first. But then when I think back to the message that's being transmitted by like senior leaders around like, oh, we need to ramp up stop and search because we have a violent crime issue, you know, often that being cited as the justification, um, it then uh, wasn't so surprising anymore. Um, but when we look at like stop and searches in England and Wales, the vast majority of the time, uh, they are for uh, the drugs or drug possession mainly. So in England and Wales in 2020, um, six, over 60% of all stop and searches were for drugs. That's the overwhelming majority. And I think it's somewhere, um, in the 18s where it was only for like uh, weapons etc so I think that that was definitely um, an insight to me that like young people's perceptions around policing and stop and search in particular was that it was being used to take weapons off the street when we know operationally and on the ground it's actually being used to police small amounts of uh, drugs namely cannabis um, yeah. And then there was also like uh, young people's experiences of uh, stop and search and um, what, what it was for them. And again, um, at the time, you, you do almost become, it's sad because you become almost uh, desensitized because you hear these uh, experiences of being stopped and searched over and over and over and over and over and over again. And most of the time it's for drugs. And I remember one young person actually um, sharing a horrific interaction that they'd had with the police. So um, in the past, they said that they had, there was these officers that constantly kept stopping and searching them. And on one occasion, this young person was with their friend and um, the officer had uh, referred to this young person's uh, referred to this young person by their name and their friend was like why does this officer know your name you know because there is this culture of like don't don't talk to the police like us and them you know um so this young person said that that had frustrated them and so the next time they saw these officers they just wanted to avoid them they did a complete u-turn and decided to walk the other way but I think 
the way that perhaps the police <laughs> perceived that was like oh like evasion like are they avoiding us like why why is this person now walking the opposite way and for them that was like suspicious so they ended up uh, pursuing this young person and this young person said that they went into like uh, this block of flats and was like going up the staircase and then waited momentarily before coming back down and officers were waiting at the bottom long story short um the officers said that they were going to stop and search this young person um because they could smell cannabis and the young person was frustrated and rightly so so then this officer is or officers are stopping and searching bearing in mind this is a 14 year old so this is a child so they're stopping okay. and searching this young person um in the staircase of a block of flats and um so they've searched this young person so outer layer of clothing hands and pockets etc and then they've um asked the young person uh to remove their trousers so that's essentially more than just your outer layer of clothing. It's a young person, you know, all these safeguarding things and issues are like now popping up in my head. And um, nothing was found as a result of that. But then I asked the young person if they'd made a complaint about this in particular interaction. And the answer was no. Um, it was, it was, it was what is the point which is again something that I heard time and time again and there is sort of this 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 wholesale lack of trust in policing and uh, the complaint system in particular so yeah I, I'd hear often um, young people being stopped in search one young person having been tasered by the police and all these horrific interactions and all of that because of uh, drugs <laughs> I think uh, you may have also heard that um, last year in Tottenham, uh, during sort of the height of the pandemic, there was this young person again, or this young adult that was uh, pursued by police in Tottenham um, for the possession of drugs. Um, so they were, the person didn't stop, they ran, the police chased them and the young, this young person was now on a wall and they tasered this person at a distance and the person had dropped and they're now paralyzed. You know, that is the, the impact of such punitive drug policies, you know? So it's, it's, it's sad that somebody can now no longer walk because of what? Drugs, you know? So, um, and this is not, it's not like nine times out of 10, I think when, I think when we think about stop and search and the policing of drugs we think oh yeah officers are using this to get like the the big drug dealers off the street and we're disrupting supply and xyz but in reality it's just again for like small simple possession offenses which is why it's frustrating but yeah that's a bit of the work that i done that's interesting because now that i think back when I was in secondary school we had like um because I went to school near Stratford and there would be like these big metal detectors and stop and search everywhere and we just assumed it was weapons like yeah. if you had a knife or anything but it's interesting that majority of the cases are actually for drugs and the brutal force that's used as a result on such young children or or people is is it's not something that would have crossed my mind and it's you're right what we think is the big gangs the cartels the things that we see on tv like power or all of those things yeah. happening it's it isn't the case in real life is it no it's not and I think in reality like when when you do start to like even um unpack like the levels of like stop and search and um the objects or reasons that these are being searched or searches are taking place and then looking at the outcomes very often it leads to no further action so it's <laughs> even if they're policing for like these small amounts it's not actually leading to an arrest but i guess there are like debates around um stop and search and whether because some people say stop and search is an effective deterrent 
Um, so it stops people from going out and doing crime. But then yeah. it's difficult to measure deterrence. But then if we're looking at the other side of the argument, which is, OK, well, we should be looking at the number of arrests. It's it's not working. <laughs> you know, it's like the level of arrest for uh, stop and searches are ridiculously low. And then it becomes just like unjustifiable. What is the point, you know? Yeah. There is obviously power in sharing people's uh, lived experience. And I obviously recognise that I'm doing this. It's like a secondary hand sort of like me saying, oh, so-and-so told me. But nonetheless, that's still somebody's lived experience. And that's as a result yeah. of our current approach to drugs. And that's we're essentially traumatising children and young people. And then we have like... The, I'm sure you're aware, but there are like discussions around um, making our police workforce more diverse and uh, trying to attract talent from Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities. But if you're mm -hmm. over policing these communities and essentially traumatizing them for what is normal in other countries or legal in other countries, then you're not, how likely is it that you're gonna have these people joining the force? And then there are also issues in terms of um, trust and confidence in policing. So uh, in order for our police to be doing their job effectively, they need people to have essentially trust in the system. You need people to be forthcoming either as victims of crime or witnesses of crime. But yeah. if there is a, uh, these uh, perceived or this per this perception of injustice or even proven injustice then how likely is it that police are going to gain that intelligence and then use that intelligence to prevent any future crime it's it's not likely so in the long run it's doing more harm than good yeah no definitely i think trust is the foundation of a lot of things most things if not everything so that's definitely where they need to start rebuilding ties but um I kind of wanted to focus on what was important so I'm guessing is it more the policing aspect that's is the most important to you in terms of drug policy and reform so I'm definitely interested in the policing element but it's it's because it's a social and racial justice uh issue and I think as a society uh we are collectively responsible for tackling uh such injustices and I think when we look at policing it's been the vehicle for driving ethnic disparities in our criminal justice system whether we're talking about stop and searches or arrests or sentencing or at every stage of the criminal justice system, when you talk about drugs, you see that there are disparities there, namely for black people. Um, and so it, it's, it's, yeah, that's mainly one of the reasons that I am particularly interested. But again, um, our current approach just exacerbates uh, these harms. So like, if you're black, you're nine times more likely to be searched for drugs than if you're white. Um, this is despite black people having lower rates of uh, self-reported drug use and uh, lower rates or fine rates um, as a result of those stop and searches for drugs. So I think without, without any reform, um, then we'll continue to criminalise people and cripple their future um, life chances and opportunities. And then that has a ripple effect and has an intergenerational effect as well on the, their future children, etc. Yeah. No. Um.